What is up, everybody? I am here with the legend, the Georgia Football Hall of Famer, and former MLB player, and famous broadcaster, Jeff Francoeur. What is up, Frenchie? I'll tell you what, you want to get me on your podcast? That's the best way to bring me on. Georgia High School Football Hall of Famer, man. That that will get me all over it. Who was the toughest guy for you to face? Like uh, Roy what, Halliday. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. God bless, God bless his soul, man. Roy Halliday was, I felt like every time I stepped in that box, he was going to shatter my back. I mean, <laughs> it was like, because he's a guy that you talk about. He had thrown 97. You know, he was sat 94. You know, he might occasionally hit 95, but you get a 2-0 count and you get a two-seamer moving that much, just barreling in on your hands. And you're like, wait a minute, this I, I'm in a 2-0 count. I should get a fastball down the middle. Let me square something up. He just, and he was the ultimate competitor. I mean, he he wanted to beat you so bad out there. He was so well prepared that I always say, you know, he didn't have the 99 to 100 like some of these guys did. But let me tell you, man, you knew when you faced him that you you had to be prepared to give three great at-bats or you were going to be over three. And he had so many really – his his whole arsenal was good with great command of everything. How did tunneling – like, so so you're dealing with someone like Halliday. Um, how much does tunneling mess you up as a hitter? Well, everything looked the same from him. And that's that's the biggest – right? You're trying to – so one of my best guys that I hit off was Dontrell Willis. I had great numbers off him. And I remember Chipper, my first time I ever faced Don Trell, my rookie year in 05 in Florida, I went 0 for 3 with 3Ks. I mean, I was looking at his leg going everywhere, you know, the arms going everywhere. And I remember Chipper saying, just don't look at anything except way out here where that ball's coming. He said, everything else, just let him do whatever he's going to do. And man, all of a sudden it was like I became a different hitter versus him. I, I was, you know doubles in the gap. I think I have four home runs in my career off him and just, just warm out because all that crap he did was gone with Roy Halladay. It was the same every time, whether you got the two seamer, whether you got the four seamer, whether you got that curveball, it came out of the exact same area. And those are the guys that are nightmares to Grom. When you got a hundred going this way and a hundred going that way, you know, I faced a Grom one time, I think in 15, and I got a double my first at bat to right field. Like, I'm pretty sure I just closed my eyes and swung. And I remember I ended up going one for three, and I was like, I don't ever want to face him again, so I can tell my kids I'm hitting 333 off one of the greatest to ever play. How well are you able to pick up spin from a pitcher, from a pitch, or is it mostly picking up other things about what the pitcher is doing that helps you tip off like it's a slider versus a curveball? I think it's so tough to pick up spin and, and really pick it up. Like here, some people I can see it. So I'm like, no, you can't. I, I don't believe them when they say that, but I do think you can see when the ball comes out of his hand, sometimes depending if it's, you know, if he's overcooking it right away, you can notice those little things sometimes. And so I think those are more of what I used to look for sometimes is like, okay, you know, if his fastball's coming out right here and you're seeing this, if that slider starts to come more to the left right away, probably it's an off-speed pitch. But the idea that you can see that dot come all the way in there, man, I, I'm – if someone can, good for them. Then, it, But they should also be hitting 400, not, not 220. <laughs> yeah, Maddox said the same thing. He's like, I don't think p hitters pick up spin virtually no. at all. No. They pick up little things. And maybe you know the situation, like Chipper to me – and I heard him when you when y'all were doing the game, he's picking up things in the situation like you should look at this because this is the way he attacked you last time. And this is, you yep. know, um, and I think that yeah, we like we used to face Aaron Heilman all the time and he'd throw two fastballs right down the middle, chip or take him. He'd hang him a change up gone. And I, I always remember thinking Aaron like Aaron Heilman went to Notre Dame, man. He was a smart guy. And I remember saying does he not know Chipper sitting on his changeup? And because all Chipper did was sit on his changeup. So I, I think there's guys like that that are smart, but I agree with Maddox. Like I, I don't see people that can see spin. I think you're looking for a little bit of a change in velocity, which you can feel a little bit depending where it's going and then where it starts and where it goes. Because ultimately, even if a guy's tunneling well, when it finally comes out of his hand, if it's a slider, it's going to have to start diving, right? Or if it's a two seamer, it's got to start pension in some so those are the things that i think you try to pick up as early as you can but it's not easy so the poor larry the poor larry a crown uh thing how, how long did you prepare that and that'll do it Woo! start the buses poor larry a crown oh man 
I'm telling you, I did not prepare that at all. I was sitting there in this corner and Chipper was at the far end and he hit that, you know, Smoltzy's calling it, we're walking. And I just looked down and I see Chipper with his hand on the crown. <laughs> and I just thought the first thing that came to me, because I know him is poor Larry, a crown. And uh, I will tell you what, man, that, that was probably the coolest game I've ever announced just, just because of the action back and forth, the walk off Homer, but you know, I don't know if you remember, we went into that game with Strider facing Verlander. Like, we thought it was going to be a two-hour and two-minute game, one nothing. We're like, we're not going to have anything to talk about. And the longest nine-inning games the Braves played all year. Oh! Oh! Get up! Oh! It's out of here! Tie ball game! <laughs> you were so Put it nervous. on the ball! Yeah! You were so nervous. <laughs> I'm a believer. Look, you hit the ball hard. My dad has told me this from the day I was four years old. I will never forget Hit the ball hard and good things will happen. And if you continue, and I remember 2019, Josh Donaldson came over to the Braves and we were down there by the cage one day, first week of May. And I remember he was hitting like a buck 60. And he told me, he said, Frenchie, my exit velocity is the second highest it's ever been in my career, you know, through this point in the season. And I, I remember going like, huh. So I was kind of like, you know, okay, you know, maybe I'll buy that, you know, and I remember just digging into his numbers more and looking at, looking at him. And I was like, man, he's been hitting the ball hard and maybe he's getting a one for four, zero for four, with two line outs, you know, this and that. And I remember like two games later, he hit two home runs in a game. And then of course that's a year, I think what he had close to 40 home runs, 39, he got that big deal with the twins, but he went on for five months and just raked. And so I think that's one of those things that that's a good look sometimes is that, you know, how many times in your career where you go through a week where maybe you have eight hits and you might've hit two balls hard and you're getting lucky. And you know, at some point that's going to run out, right? We always see the balls in play when a guy starts the year hitting 400. It's like, there's no way he can keep that pace. And, and it happens. And so, you know, I think numbers like that can give fans a good perspective. Like, okay, this guy's not, he might only be hitting a buck 70 right now, but Get ready. He's about to get hot. You started pure athlete. Um, yep. And one of the tenets of it is to play multiple sports, but it's really about the youth athlete and maybe kind of shaping the way we look at youth athletics. And I love what you're doing because, I mean, we, we had talked about this a little off camera. I started flat ground to help out young athletes to, yep. I mean, bottom line, I don't think baseball or any sport really should be a rich kid sport. It's kind of crap that that happens. And yep. you shouldn't, you should be able to find every piece of information you need to get good. Like we're in the internet age. You should be able to do it yourself and you don't need ridiculous money for coaching and other stuff and helps parents empower themselves. So let me you know, know a little what, bit about what you're doing. Yeah, there's, there's so many, so we can get into a lot of this, but there's so many places to play, right? I mean, there's a park. If I wanted to sign my kid up, I live here in Suwannee, Georgia. I have six parks within 15 minutes that I could sign my kid up for. And so, you know, I've always said, just sign them up, you know, as far as bats and gloves, there's parents, there's people that will help if they need to, to get stuff, but get your kid out there to play. And I think that's the first thing, you know, is to be able to play the sport, learn the sport, develop, I'm big in development. So, you know, a lot of our podcast, and I'm all about, look, being competitive, being all this stuff like this, don't get me wrong. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not here to sit there and say, you know, you can't win, you can't do this, but you know, at the same time, when these kids are younger, it's all about the development of the kid. And I just am very passionate about that, that, you know, kids need to be able to play sports to be able to, you know, not only develop their skill in that sport, but life lessons, being a good teammate, all this. Now, again, like I said, if you know me, I'm as competitive as the next guy. I tell my 10 travel ball team, every time we step out on that field, we're trying to win a ball game. And we're going to play our butts off to win the ball game. But again, this is where I say at a young age, not over the development of a kid. And I refuse to do that. And so, you know, about a year and a half ago, Britt, um, Lee and Brad Williams, who I do the podcast with, had this idea, right? And they kind of pitched it to me. And, you know, I get a lot of stuff brought to me or, you know, different ideas, do this, do that. And as I was getting into coaching my kids, I was kind of like, man, there really is a need for this. You know, I'd gone through a season of coaching and I'm like, we need coaches that understand what they're doing, the right way to do it. And, um, you know, so the podcast kind of just taken off. And I, I will tell you this, I have learned more. 
I think we've had about 50 now with different athletes. I've learned more through that than I ever imagined in my life. Yeah, I could imagine. So this is one of those things that I think actually stepping away, it's just like teaching, right? Like you don't learn what you don't know and you don't learn it as much in depth until you're actually Mm -hmm. teaching it. And I think it's that way with sports too, as well as broadcasting it. Like you, you're looking at it from a totally different angle, probably would have made you a better player, you know, even than you were having that. Man, information. Let me tell you, I, I, I sit there in the booth all the time and go, why did I not think about this stuff when <laughs> I played? Like I can almost call at least every two out of three pitches thinking along with the batter. I'm like, man, if I'd have known this, I'd have done this, but you do, you live and you learn. And there's numerous times that still I'm coaching and, you know, my wife might be like, hey, remember what you were talking about on that podcast? I'm like, crap. OK, I got <laughs> it. You know, I'll check myself. So it's funny. It's really tough, though. So you mentioned a great thing, because I think I hear a lot of times, hey, I'm into development. Winning doesn't matter. And then I hear winning at all costs and, you know, whatever. But winning is part of it. Like, number one, you bring out the best of you by competing. Number Absolutely. two, kids stay with a sport because they're on a winner. Like winning is important. They don't want to be on the crappiest team out there, but development's also important. How do you balance there, that? There, there's got to be a balance. And I think that's exactly, I hate winning at all costs. That That's the dumbest thing. I, I can't stand when people say that because I'm like, what's all caught? What are you going to give your life to win a, <laughs> to win a 10, you, 10, 10, you, you know, football game? No. And I want my, my kids to know there's a difference between winning and losing. And I always say this, my kids, myself and i'm sure you're the same way with your kids you learn more from failure than you do from winning all the time how they bounce back you know what what motivates them you know do they do they come home let's go to the cage and work let's go out to the soccer field and kick the ball around for an hour and get better those are all important and i want my trust me you come watch our 10 u softball team i i'm on the girls i mean i'm 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 teaching them i'm intense but i've always told them the only two times you'll ever hear me yell at them is if you don't listen or if you're not hustling. Those are the only two times you'll ever hear me get on the girls. You strike out, you make an error. When you come in the dugout, we'll talk for a minute. We'll we'll figure out what we got to do to get better. And that that's the that's the difference for me. I I think that you know, when your kids 10 years old, okay? As a parent, have an idea of are they good? Where do they stack up? You know, take it out. Every parent, my kids the great. Come on, let's be honest. Like my daughter has has really made strides. She's not the best on the team. I'm going to tell you that right now. I hit her seventh, for God's sakes. You know, I don't <laughs> hit my daughter third, but she keeps moving up and she keeps getting better and we're working on it. So have an idea where that ranks. And if your kid's not getting playing time, if this team is way too intense, take them to another team so they can play. I, I go back my fourth grade football team, man. We had, we had four or five of us that were the best players in fourth grade. By the time we got to freshman year of high school, two of those players had quit. They weren't getting any playing time, weren't any good anymore. And one just kind of just played special teams. So here it is five guys and only two of us really got to high school and played. These were the best guys. Either they didn't grow, they didn't work. And so I've always said it, man, I want to see the kids play. I want to see them compete. I want to see you get beat. I want to see you come back from it and, and, and keep going. 